Shop, Founder Friday Edition. Today, we're talking with Colin Whitcomb of Canary Coffee Bar in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Christy Furio. I'm your host for the show, and welcome to this Founder Friday, the last Founder Friday of the year, and it's quite a good one, too. Um, we are talking with Colin Wickham. He is the owner of the newly opened Canary Coffee Bar, opened back in uh, August, and the uh, before and after episode is what we're in for today. So we kind of get the planning, the opening, and the operation of a business, a little snapshot. And today, that is Canary Coffee Bar. And Colin has a lot of awesome things that he shares in this episode. So I'm excited that you are uh, joining me today. Now, if you have not yet subscribed to Keys to the Shop, I would encourage you to uh, hit the subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. That way, you'll never miss any episodes. Also, uh, remember to share these episodes uh, with a friend who you think will benefit from the content of them. And right now, there's a few days left to vote in the finals of the Sprudgies, the 11th annual Sprudgies for Best Coffee Podcast. Keys to the Shop has been uh, nominated and is in the finals for that. If you want to vote, there's a link in the uh, Instagram account, and there's also going to be a link in the show notes for you to use uh, to do that. And uh, thank you so much. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is one of the world's best specialty coffee equipment suppliers, supplying you with all of the equipment that you need to open a great coffee bar and run a great operation. Um, Whether you're in the market for uh, commercial espresso machines, grinders, brewers, etc., Um, or uh, under-counter refrigeration and sinks and things like that. They have you covered on the full spectrum of commercial equipment for your business's needs, whether you're just opening a coffee bar or you're uh, scaling your existing coffee bar to a a new location. These are the folks that you're going to want to work with to help you get established, to help you get the right equipment for your situation. Now, at the moment, Prima Coffee is running a special for Keys to the Shop listeners. You get 5% off your order when you go to this link, prima-coffee.com backslash keys. And when you go there, use the code HOLIDAY5. That's HOLIDAY and the number 5 afterwards, and you get 5% off your order. Some restrictions to apply. Again, that's prima-coffee.com backslash keys to get 5% off your order. And, And again, I would highly recommend visiting these guys because they just do amazing work, helping you do amazing work in your coffee bar. So prima-coffee.com backslash keys. And thank you so much, Prima, for your support of Keys to the Shop. Today's episode is also brought to you by the lovely folks over at Pacific Foods and the Pacific Barista Series. That is, of course, the leading line of plant-based performance beverages that are designed specifically for professional baristas. And not just for them, but also with them, with a lot of feedback from the community of baristas that use these products every day. That's why they perform so well. It's why they call them performance beverages, because they stand up to the heat from steaming. They produce great texture that you can make latte art with any of their products. And the flavor balance of the beverage is focused still on the coffee. So you're not going to have an overwhelming flavor of any one thing. It's like a balance that your customers really want and Pacific delivers in spades. So um, this is an amazing company that is a huge supporter of specialty coffee in the barista community. And the design of these products is just one of the examples of why they're a great company. And I think you should use them in your store too. Uh, At least get them in your store to try them out for yourself. Um, Try these products and let your guests try them as well. See what the feedback is. And I think you're going to be impressed by the flavor and the performance of the Barista Series. So uh, go to pacificfoods.com to learn more about the Barista Series. You can also use the link in the show notes for that. And thank you so much, Pacific, for your support of Keys to the shop. All right, so today we get to talk with Colin Whitcomb of Canary Coffee Bar. Colin has been in the specialty coffee industry for uh, 14 years, and in that time has uh, worked in some amazing cafes as a barista, uh, trainer, and quality control manager. Uh, He is on the executive council of the Barista Guild of America and is a veteran competitor in the United States barista competitions, uh, putting together some really great routines and is always a very super positive person. You might even recognize his voice 
as he is a commentator along with Ashley Rodriguez of the Boss Barista podcast on the uh, live streams of the coffee competitions. So I'm excited to get to talk with Colin today as this is his first coffee bar and uh, and it's really awesome to uh, see somebody of his caliber and experience opening a coffee bar, not just because he is a super nice guy and we need more people like that uh, serving the customers, you know, but also because he has so much experience and an eye for quality and has seen so many people operate coffee bars. Um, and that means that when you start with that kind of experience, you start with a leg up on a lot of other people. Now, uh, of course, that doesn't mean that everything goes perfect. In fact, in these episodes of Founder Friday, we know no matter how much experience you have, thing, there's always going to be challenges. There's always going to be something that happens with the city, something that happens with a, uh, the decor or the build out, um, whatever it may be. Business it equals a lot of problems. And just maybe you have a little bit more experience to draw from to solve those problems, but you can't get rid of them. And you're going to get to see all sides of this as we talk with Colin about those issues and all the great and positive things involved in running a business as well. This is a before and after episode. So we got to talk with Colin uh, to about a month before he opened Canary and then three months after Canary has been opened. So you get to hear from kind of two different Collins, <laughs> the one kind of running around planning, building out, dealing with the city, you know, de- you know dealing with how to approach staffing, um, working on the concept of a coffee bar, which is a really cool and unique concept. And then afterwards, having three months operated this coffee bar, what is different what expectations uh, have been met? What things were a surprise? How are things going? I love doing episodes in this fashion because it gives us this really um, cool snapshot of a, the life of a business. So and I hope that you enjoy it as well and take something from uh, Colin's experiences. He shares a lot of really great things and has some good advice for us that I hope you follow um, and he is doing some really great work there. So obviously if you're in Milwaukee, you should be making a beeline to Canary Coffee Bar. But without further ado from me, because this is a bit of a longer episode being a two-parter, um, here now is my two-part interview with Colin Whitcomb of Canary Coffee Bar. Well, hey, Colin, welcome to Keys to the Shop. I'm excited to talk to you today about your business. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. Uh, it seems like a long time coming for you with you know, how long you've been in the industry. And I, actually, how many years? It's been, it's got to be, what, like 10, over 10? It's going to be, I guess it's going to be 14 years in June. Man. Um, so it's like 13 years, something like that. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, has this been a dream of yours to open a coffee shop since the beginning or is this a a project that you just started thinking you know um i, I kind of want to open a coffee shop it, did it come up recently okay well uh i can't say that i've had like long-term plans to open a coffee shop um i have enough experience in coffee um knowing people who own businesses who own cafes to be a little scared about the amount of work that goes into owning a small business. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I worked for Madcap Coffee for a number of years, and I, I can vividly remember um, Madcap's founder and CEO, Trevor, like um, working on his computer at like one or two in the morning on business trips all the time. Um, so we're obviously a little bit of a smaller operation than a roasting company like that. But we, this idea didn't really come to us like fully formed and like get verbalized until I think it was like March of, um, 2018, something like that. So like about a little bit over a year, year and a couple months ago. Um, so yeah, it was, it was an idea that occurred, I think to my wife and I at around the same time, we had a little bit of money to try to do something with because we sold the house and, uh, it actually kind of felt like maybe the last good option or the good idea that we had left. Um, I had recently moved back to Milwaukee and was trying to locate a place for myself and especially coffee scene here. Um, and was having some difficulty kind of doing that. I had a lot of, I was sort of caught in between like everybody who was new and a startup here. I had way more experience than 
them and then a lot of the more established companies here it, it wasn't always a good fit for me um so um yeah one night my wife and i just looked at each other and we're basically like what if we started our own coffee shop <laughs> I love how amusing that is to, like to to think about and I as you recall it I just imagining your mind being flooded with all of the things you've seen people you've worked for like you were talking about Trevor Corlett and mm-hmm. and other folks um but it it does seem like you work yourself to a point where you like you said you it's your last option because you know what is all this you know, knowledge and experience, how does it all get like used in right. wherever you might be? Maybe it's, uh, you could be used in a bigger city or, or whatever, but, um, yeah, you, you definitely seem like you've, you've graduated to this idea that almost wasn't your decision. It's sort of interesting. I think in a way you're like, you're in specialty coffee, you're pursuing a career in specialty coffee and you do take advantage of the opportunities that are given to you. You, latch on to certain things that you feel like you would be good at or certain things that maybe come more naturally to you. And so the, the skill set that I ended up with is sort of just the skill set that I ended up with. You know, I was, I was never drawn to roasting or like, I don't have a ton of green buying experience or anything like that. So it's also, I think sort of looking at what you can do, what you like doing and like, what's an achievable thing. And this felt like something like, I know I'm, I'm feeling pretty positive. Like I can run a coffee shop. I can make this successful if we can get it off the ground. Well, what about your past experience makes you feel that way? What, what sort of became uh, your bag in coffee? Well, I think I is one. I've always loved like being a barista in terms of like hanging out with people, talking to people, talking about coffee with people. That's always energized me. Um, And like, no matter what role I've had, I think like sharing coffee and talking about coffee with people has always been one of the more exciting parts about it. So that was one of the things that I think, uh, I knew that I had going for me as well. And then I've got a bit of experience helping people start coffee shops. I've done sales. I've done a lot of wholesale training and through those experiences, you come into contact with a lot of people who are like in a startup phase with their coffee business. Um, so, and which is a much wider spread of abilities and, and skill sets than I might originally have thought. So when you, when you come across a lot of people like that, you definitely, and you, you have the experience of like creating really positive um, moments for people when they come to the coffee shop, you definitely kind of think like we, we can do this or I can do this. If we just have the, if we can create the space, like we can do this. Mm-hmm. Except now there's no safety net. No, there's no, there is no safety net. Yeah. As, <laughs> as Lorenzo Perkins said, it's all on you. Oh, good. Thanks for the encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> so what I feel like this has something to do with the name of your coffee bar. Like what's, what's behind the name of a uh, Canary coffee bar? Yeah. So when we, when we started the, uh, when we, you know, started the company, we, I wasn't really set on any particular type of name. I think we, we felt like we, my wife and I, Emily, felt like we understand that like we live in a world where brand is important, brand identity is important. And I can certainly say from my experience at Madcap that like when we would run into um, an issue, like how are we going to resolve this? How are we going to present ourselves? How are we going to like present the coffee or whatever? A lot of times we would have this discussion that would come back to kind of like, who are we as a company? Who are we as a brand? So we we knew that we needed some kind of brand and and also that the brand can communicate lots of things emotionally or visually about a, about a company that, you know, um, is a little easier. Right. It just almost happens on like a subconscious level. So uh, my brother Andrew has a PhD in design and his wife is a designer too. Um, they helped us a little bit with the name and they had all kinds of crazy ideas for us. Uh, like the letter E was one of them. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> just, just the letter E, which I was kind of into uh, for a little bit. I'm like, we'll just call it E. I'll meet you at E. <laughs> uh. 
I don't know. They had a <laughs> bunch. Of, I wish I, I wish I wish I, I should dig up the list of names that they had because it was some really wild stuff. Um, but I think ultimately we wanted something that like felt fun, that felt light, colorful, a little bit playful, something that was like sort of recognizable as well. So the I think I, I think Canary might have been Emily's idea that we would call it Canary. And, uh, of course, then you're like looking around like, does anyone else in America have a canary? <laughs> we didn't see that. So, um, I think those are the reasons why we were originally attracted to the idea of like canary. Nice. Nice. So w- describe the concept for us and in terms of you know, you know, your business plan or what you plan to achieve with this coffee bar, what is canary coffee bar? Okay. So. Yeah, I, this is a little bit of a funny conversation because I think like we've been we've been going back and forth on this in coffee. I think for maybe like seven or eight years, um, I think a lot about that James Hoffman talk where it was at the they still called it symposium then, and he's saying something about how like the way that we serve specialty coffee is like the same way that you order at McDonald's or whatever, right? So, and it, and I guess in a way, like we've been sort of like caught in this tension since then, or at least I feel like I've been caught in this tension since then. This, on one hand, the desire to like really present a coffee to people, create compelling experiences for people, and like a little more space for coffee, maybe. Um, but then sort of like feeling stymied by the way that we're serving coffee. So, right now, <laughs> I'm committed to doing. Um, a seated service at the bar and seated table service as well. Um, and I think that's the, the big thing that I'm interested in. Now, in Milwaukee, we have a really strong bar culture. A lot of Some listeners may not know this, but in Wisconsin, you can bring your kids to the bar. So a lot of people grow up going to bars, and it feels very homey to them. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to capitalize a little bit on this concept of like the bar kind of being at the heart of what it means to like be in Milwaukee. Um, bars are very casual places. A lot of bars look like houses here. You can see bars just like that. Is that a house in the corner? Like, nope, that's a bar. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> it's really interesting. Um, so I think we're trying to say to people like, you know, the way you interact with a bar, like a beer bar here in Milwaukee is like very easy. It's very casual. Like you can grab a seat, you can walk in, you can make conversation with somebody you're greeted and it's a little bit more of a seamless experience for for a user. So in a certain way, we're trying to rep- replicate that. Um, so that's a big part of what I'm trying to do is just create uh, that kind of more seamless experience. Um, so and then the other part of what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to offer a larger menu of coffees. Um, like a lot of places that you go to, if they have a pour over menu, you might see like three or four maybe coffees in a menu. And sometimes it's not even um, the most thoughtfully curated three coffees. Like I tell people, like I've been to specialty coffee shops and you look at their pullover menu and it's like going into a bar and them saying, um, yeah, we have a West Coast IPA. We got like an East Coast IPA and then some other really hoppy beer. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know, Um, and you're like, geez, what about any other style? So. The other thing that I'm committed to doing in terms of coffee is trying to have a menu of like somewhere between six or maybe 10 coffees that have that represent a larger range of styles. So like I want something on there that's like dark. I want something on there that's more light and aromatic. You know, I something more balanced. Um, I'm, I'm not opposed to like really anything. I'm really trying to celebrate the whole range of flavors in coffee. Um, so that those are the two big things in terms of like, you know, when you write a business plan, you're definitely trying to convince like a lender in our case, like that we're going to be different. We're going to be better than the other players in this market. Right. So those are the definitely things that we are trying to lean on from the, from creating a business plan standpoint to help us like show a lender that we can stand out and be different. But also like that is really at at the core of what we're trying to do too. That that sounds very intriguing. It it exactly like you would expect to find, like you were describing at a craft brewery. Um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of work that goes into 
this versus what coffee bars are used to because half of the yeah. load of what you just described is is not there at the typical coffee bar because people you know seat themselves and they come up to the bar and they you know pick up their drink at the bar um also the the number of coffees that you're offering it's like you've got to take care of all these people but then you also have to take mm-hmm. care of all these coffees like the coffees are people too and yeah how how are you planning to achieve that like what kind of structure or systems you're going to have in place to really support the idea of taking care of the people table side and also Mm -hmm. taking care of that many coffees without sort of letting the quality slip through the cracks. (laughs) Yeah, well, it's definitely ambitious. Like I, I would just say like as a metric for how I think ambitious of an idea, this is like, I think I've had four, maybe five USBC champions be like, this is a crazy idea. You should try to do something simpler. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so, um, that being said, so here's how I, here's how I think we can make this work. All right. So we've got a bunch of like iPads and iPhones to like make use of Square's ability to like, you know, take orders and take payment anywhere. Um, so we have that. And then I think we are asking a lot out of people. Like when, when we've been interviewing people, one of the primary things I've been trying to do is just be like this is the ask for the people that are going to be here. Like you're going to be making drinks and then someone's going to sit down in front of you and look at you. And like, you're going to have to like pause for a moment and like serve them, you know? Mm. Um, and it's going to have to be like natural. So the people, the people that are, you know, on board with trying to do something like that, it hasn't been everybody, um, have been good candidates for us. Um, so yeah, I've got, I've got ideas. Like I've been working part-time, in a coffee shop while I've been getting this thing off the ground. So I do have ideas about like how I think we can make this work. One of the issues that you run into in terms of like speed of service at coffee shops is like you accept payment from everybody right after you take their order. So my hope is that by like deferring payment for those people that are going to stay, we'll be able to kind of like move through to go drinks and creating drinks for those people that are going to stay a little bit more quickly. Um, and, uh, so I'm getting rid of the hand pour over coffee too. I don't think there's any way we can do this if we have a person like hand pouring coffee. So I have two Wilbur Curtis gold cups that I'm going to try to figure out a good system for like pushing out um, this like larger menu of coffees. And then here's the other thing is like, of course, Canary is going to have like a lot of coffees and we're going to like have this big range of coffees, but we're not so foolish enough to think that like that's all we can do so i'm really into this idea of like need states so i have like i'm trying to have a larger range of items than just coffee so i have like a four tap fridge going in we have a tea menu like we're gonna have some other bottle drinks so i'm also trying to like have other types of drinks that we can make and serve quickly that are a little bit less time consuming than like just coffee (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that's a big, big part, part of it, right. Is like, we can't, we can't be like serving everybody like a single cup of coffee because it would just take forever. Um, also like we're going to be right in the heart of downtown Milwaukee. So I don't know that something like that is necessarily even always going to be like what people are looking for. Sure. I mean, you're going to have groups of people touring the, the area and right. know, half the people in a group are not going to really want coffee. They just went there because of the two people that did. Right. Maybe they want something bottled. You make some more money there, get them right. in and out. And uh, are you going to have food in this place? <laughs> yes, we're going to have food. My sister-in-law does uh, recipe development for, uh, I believe it's home chef. She's great. And so uh, she's been a chef for a number of years. So she's helping us figure out, um, a simple kind of what she's calling like open faced sandwich menu. Um, so I've got like a single prep top cooler to like make the job of getting like a little open faced sandwich together a little bit easier. Um, and, uh, and we're working with a baker here too, whose name is Molly um, to bring in like, you know, coffee cakes and all that kind of stuff. We're not going to bring in muffins. Nice. Um, <laughs> it's the type of like, the, you know, like when you start, when you're and you're looking out, to another peer in your industry, you run to these people that's like, she didn't even want to sell us bakery. You know what I mean? She's like, I'm not ready to do wholesale. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, One of those. 
So we're letting Molly kind of be like, you know, this is what I think is good. This is what I think will last more than a day. Um, so we'll have some, we'll have a little bit of like light eats in there too. Um, and I think we'll try to add, we'll try to add food. I'm, I want to start simple, but I, I would like to try to add like as much food as we can, honestly. So when you're looking at all of these different responsibilities that you've got and promises mm-hmm. you're making to customers, like we're going to have these great sandwiches and baked mm-hmm. goods, coffees mm-hmm. and table service, all that stuff, right? And, mm-hmm. and you're mm-hmm. building these systems to support that. Um, what? Because you're opening pretty soon. As yeah. of this conversation, I think it's within a month, right? That's the target. Yeah, if within a month, yeah. Yeah, so I think... A, a good question for for me here is like, what do you think is necessary to have, or do you absolutely think you need to have in terms of documents that people refer to as your staff that you think will get you by? Because I imagine there's going to be more as you go a year from now. You'll have twice as many standard operating procedures and checklists and things oh. like, like that what is your what is your binder or what is your documentation look like right now or what will it look like when you open yeah in terms of like how we're dialing in coffees and just like creating all the drinks and stuff like that yeah and also yeah. just you know taking care of the cafe uh policy manuals oh. and stuff that uh-huh. people will need to sort of upkeep the culture yeah um so I have a little bit of uh, help from my lender to like get like an employee handbook and all that stuff together. So I, 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 I'm hopeful that we'll have a pretty solid handbook and, and when we open to at least cover like some of those basic things. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I guess I have a little bit of peace in terms of like there's a play between like the control and chaos in terms of like um, – how copies might get dialed in or something like that. I'm okay with people having a little bit more freedom in in that area. So I don't know. Of course, I'm hopeful that like, we're not going to have to have like too many like SOPs around for stuff. But at the same time, like I, I guess um, I think that probably like the week up to opening and like the week as we open will be a time of major discovery where like we, are able to sort of finalize and understand exactly um, what those procedures are going to be. So I guess I have to admit, I've been sort of leaving that stuff for the end. (laughs) Sure. Sure. That makes sense. There's a ton of stuff that you've got on your plate right now. Um, Yeah. uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes. (laughs) We were, we were talking a little bit about that before this conversation actually. And it's, this is a good time to talk about it, I think, because, you know, aside from the challenges of, you know, projecting what you're going to need to run the shop, you know, you've got to actually build the shop and yeah. you all uh, have taken on some stuff yourself. And, um, there's been some cha- there have been some challenges. It sounds like wh- as you have mm-hmm. built out this space, maybe some surprises, talk a little bit about what your experience has been. Um, once you, uh, signed the lease and are, are going in there, like, what have you discovered about the build out phase that's both like awesome and not so awesome? Okay. Well, I think um understanding how much money you have for like what people would call a construction cost, just the money to like put the space together, like without furniture or anything, um can be tough. It's like every space you look at has different things that it needs or doesn't need and um, I think it took us a lot longer to understand what that total construction cost was going to be than it should have. Um, so it's actually, it's sort of, I, I was in my original like budget that I wrote to open Canary, I was almost ex- like, looks like going to be almost exactly close to what, what we're going to end up spending to do it. Um, oh, wow. so yeah, which is, I think just kind of, we convinced ourselves we could do it for a lot less and then needed more. Um, so I guess I would just advise anybody out there to like, try to have, uh, a, a, you know, a larger than smaller construction cost. So anyways, yeah, this is what happened. So then we like sign a lease on this space and like, we think we can do it for whatever we think we can do it for. And then we start getting, um, a bunch of contractors in there getting quotes from them and then realize like we didn't have enough money. So I applied for grants. I applied for like micro loans. I fundraised extra money to cover this construction cost. 
Um, but in so doing decided that like we would work with our contractor whose name is Steve McGuire. He's a super nice guy. Um, to try to like lower the overall construction cost by doing certain parts of the construction ourselves. So like, for example, like I'm putting, um, we're putting our own like grab bars into the bathroom. Like we bought in our, in our selling our own like handicapped grab bars in the bathroom. Um, we painted the entire space ourselves. We're installing our own cabinetry. We put up our own FRP, which is that like bumpy, fiberglass reinforced plastic that you see in like cafes and like fast food places everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a, you know, it's a clean washable surface and you can caulk it. So no water gets back there. That's a health code thing. But like, I'll, I think ultimately what's ended, what's ending hap- what's happening right now, Chris is like, we're like feeling the pressure to open summer's coming to a close. We would like to get our feet under us before that happens. Um, and of course we hoped to open like a month ago. Right. Right. But like the contractor and the subcontractors that are working with him, like kind of need us to finish certain parts before they can do the parts that they need to do. (laughs) Right. It's not a, I I think we're, I think we're okay at this point, but that, that the thing is like, we're completely an expert at all these things. Right. Sure. Like I've never climbed a ladder up. 16 feet high and painted the corner of a wall and a ceiling before. And it's a little intimidating to like do something like that, you know? So like, uh, yeah. So when we painted the space, like we got a paint sprayer and like went around and like painted it with this paint sprayer. But like, because I have no skill with the paint sprayer, I got paint like all over the ceiling, which is black and the walls are white. (laughs) So then I had to spend like six hours a day after that with like black spray paint up there, like, trying to fix that issue um right well it's better than the reverse i guess yeah totally and if you know like my parents owned a commercial painting business for four years my dad like he mentored with this like master (laughs) german painter i don't know it's a long story colin your Um, family can i just interject and say your family has a lot of unique and useful experiences (laughs) yeah totally man totally (laughs) I think that, I mean, in terms of like Horst, yeah, my dad, my dad's mom knew this German guy and she's like, you're going to apprentice with Horst and he taught him. So my dad's a very intense, he's not a painter anymore. He's a doctor now, but, um, so he came over, I guess it was on Sunday and like helped us like fix it all and make it look great. So nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but Emily's family has been super involved with this too. Like her mother set tile in the bathroom for us. She helped us paint. She's been doing all kinds of stuff. So we have a ton of support um, from our family to get this done. But I think that's sort of the, that sort of in a nutshell is like, like the cabinetry thing too. So I buy Ikea cabinets. Now the thing is like all the, all the contractors we talked to, quoted us something like 10 to maybe 13 or $14,000 to build a bar out of cabinets, like custom cabinetry. And I would say to them, like, that's not custom cabinets. Like those are just regular cabinets that you're sticking together in a row. Like Mm -hmm. the bar doesn't turn. It has right angles. How can this be $10,000? There's no doors. There's no drawers. (laughs) There's only shelves. Some of them are just empty inside. So we ended up like deciding we would do our own Ikea cabinets, <laughs> which I guess like I have a bunch of friends who have Ikea kitchens and they're like, you can do this, Colin, you can do this, which I guess gives me some peace of mind. But nice. like we can't put the countertop in until we build the cabinets and get them mounted on the wall. Right. How much money do you think you've saved by taking on some of the stuff yourself? Oh, I don't know. Honestly, it, I won't be able to tell you that until the end mm. I because like I'll just have to I would have to go back and look at, I guess, what some of the original quotes were. And then will we end up actually paying Steve to do it? Um, but I'm guessing it's going to be thousands of dollars. Like, I mean, how much do you think it costs to get somebody to paint your space professionally? I don't know. Or like we're going to drop in our own ceiling tiles because like, dude, it's so easy. You just cut them, you drop them in. No big deal. It doesn't even have to be a clean cut because they sit behind the edge of the um, grid, yeah. right? So how much do you think it costs to have some people just drop in vinyl ceiling tiles or whatever, right? Um, so I think I think in the end it almost became like, like 
less about how much and just a more about like, we will do literally everything that we think we can do. Um, because that's how close we are. Like you, we have to have money left over when we open this business, right? They can't go down to be like, Oh, we have a thousand bucks left to open. <laughs> right. Well then you, uh, yeah, you have payroll after that. And absolutely. We have to buy our first orders of coffee, all that stuff. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're doing the wise thing and so many people, you feel pretty scared to take on some of those things themselves, but from what you're talking about and what and I've heard from other folks as well, if you have the ability to do something and you take it on yourself, you, you save the money and it's not as scary as it seems because when you're talking to a contractor, it, it does make it, they, they will, if it's their job, you know, they're going to make it sound like only they can do it. Mm -hmm. Um, but as in uh, most cases, a little skepticism goes a long way and it sounds like you all are uh, going down a, a pretty good route. Um, I have a question about your staff, actually. you mm -hmm. a, a while ago, you posted that you're hiring. I imagine you've got the people or some of the people that you are going to be uh, putting on payroll. Mm -hmm. what, what are you, how are they, your employees right now? What are the, you, I want to say, what are you doing with them? But um, what are they doing right now before open? How does that work? Well, they're all doing their normal jobs right now. <laughs> and I'm basically in constant contact with them because of course they're very anxious to get started. And also they're looking to have some kind of firm, like I'm going to give notice at the job that I'm at. Um, so they're all like just out there doing their thing right now. And like we text and we email and stuff like that. I check in on them. Um, but I'm not really asking anything of them yet. Um, since they're, they're not hired and we don't even have a space for them to even kind of come in and do any training. So yeah, a lot of stuff is just kind of like we've got people ready to go and it's just kind of like simmering until we can get like our cabinets together and stuff. And then I'll have like the emotional and physical space to like actually whatever. So yeah, <laughs> the I, emotional I would, space. Yeah, that was I, good. Yeah. But it's, it's real. And I think like, you know, I appreciate, um, the, like the, the willingness to be like, you know, to, if I, to phrase us for taking on like the extra work of building the cafe, but like there is an actual real trade off that you make where like um, I cannot be focused on some of that higher level stuff as much as I'd like to right now because like there's all this super real construction stuff that I need to try to take care of. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, every time we're at making one of these decisions, like I'm always like, man, like I know this is probably saving us money, but it's also creating like more anxiety and more stress because we have to make a choice. And like, I think, you know, the millennial burnout is something that becomes so real when you're opening uh, something like a coffee shop, like millennials have such a hard time making choices. We feel like every choice has got to be the perfect choice, the most sustainable choice, the best looking choice, the whatever. <laughs> so like everything is like that. What kind of backsplash are we going to use? Oh man, it's exhausting. So those those things like have has sort of like made it made it the case that like our employees kind of just need to like hang out for a second until I can like get them some more resources. So I've ex I've hired people with experience. Everybody is currently a barista. They know how to prepare espresso. They know how to steam milk and stuff like that. Um, I was realistic with myself enough to say like I don't think that it would be fair. Um, to the person or to me to bring on somebody who I think would have great service, but like no coffee experience. Mm. Um, I just don't think we have the time to bring somebody up to speed. Like, okay, talk someone through his seven menu coffee, uh, you know, seven coffee menu go. And you have no experience. Well, especially for <laughs> your concept, your concept is not the average coffee concept, you know, right. That, right. That's indeed I, like the average coffee shop maybe onboards somebody with no experience but has maybe a little bit of hospitality background or good people skills. They can get them functional right. because there's right. so much efficiency in built in for them. Right. But um, so you've got a lot of verbal contracts from people mm, that that's are, right. are interested in, in working. And the, all of this is just sort of potent, this potential energy in the mm -hmm. space. And once it's open, what is it that you hope happens? What do you, what do you, how do you want the community to embrace this? What, in your, when you're thinking about the first few customers in the door to about a few months 
down the line of being open, what kind of things do you hope come true uh, for Canary Coffee Bar? Oh, uh, honestly, all, all I want is for people to just like come in and, and just enjoy themselves. Like if we get people to come in and just like feel good about their time in the coffee shop, like that is the really almost like the only thing that I care about. Um, I think that if we get people to have that feeling, then they will come back. They will have people come back with them. Like I, it, I, I'm almost having trouble like building a coffee menu right now. I just told this to Emily. I'm like, I don't even, it's almost like I don't even care what coffees we put on. Like I only care about like how well we are able to take care of people when they come in. So that's what I'm hopeful for is that like we can like see people for who they want to be seen as and like help them feel welcome in the space. That's my complete focus right now. Excellent. Well, um, this is funny. Let me ask you, uh, just, just play along, I guess, but when are you, what's predict it right here? What's the opening date? <laughs> Oh man, I, I it's so hard to say. But if we opened on like August fifteenth or sixteenth, I think I I think that would be like pretty good. Or or maybe a, it wouldn't. The best we could do would probably be a couple of days ahead of that. But like, I would like. I guess I'd be a little sad if we didn't open in by like August seventeenth or something like that. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk about some of this process leading up to the opening of your bar, and I, I think it's it it's looking like it's coming along really well. Following on Instagram, um, and I appreciate your vulnerability sharing some of the stuff that you're going through. I know it's helping a lot of folks that are in the same boat or about to be in the same boat as you. Uh, and when we come back to you uh, after you're open, uh, I'm going to enjoy hearing about how people have been enjoying your space and how you've been enjoying it. Oh, I really appreciate you giving me the chance to talk about it. And yeah, the vulnerability thing is something that I'm really trying to lean into right now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, man. And uh, I guess we'll see you soon. All right. Take care, Chris. Well, Colin, here we are again. Uh, welcome back to Keys to the Shop. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's so funny. I know you know people listening to this have just heard us talk about um, the <laughs> pre-planning you know, planning stage, and you had told everyone that um, you know August seventeenth was the you know deadline for opening and the, the desired open date. Um, and I, okay. I don't think that you missed it by uh -huh. that much, but when did you open? August 27th was the day that we finally opened. And I think at a certain point, it was kind of like, you know, you reach that point where it's like, it could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be the day after that. Like, you just kind of like decide like, okay, I guess this is it. We're going to go. Yeah. So your uh, lead up into that point, you finalized a bunch of stuff for build out. And, and when we had last talked, you were uh, trying to just get all the last minute pieces together to be able to open. What was the journey like from that point forward, like the biggest, um, the biggest hurdles to get you over the hump to say to everybody, hey, we actually have an open date now that we're definitely going to open on? I think we were basically done and we're waiting for a bunch of like really just like red tape city stuff that the city had an issue at the end of August here in Milwaukee where they didn't have enough like inspectors for certain things like they were short of electrical inspectors and stuff like that. So at a certain point sometime around like I think the 25th or the 26th we were basically done and we just needed to kind of like finish out some inspecting stuff. Um, our plumber also kept like trying to do the least amount of work that he could do. And like, we had to have a plumbing inspector come back a couple of times, but it was for us, like just these final little inspection things that, uh, kept our doors shut for an extra couple of days. Mm. Um, so, and that's, that stuff that was like, you know, for the most part, like out of kind of out of my control. It's like the calls have been made. The person knows they need to go. Like you're just waiting for their schedule to open it up so that they can be there. What were you doing in the meantime, as you're waiting for the plumber, as you're going through waiting for the city to get these things approved? Um, what kind of things do you uh, find yourself doing to promote the brand, to get ready, to get your staff ready? Cause I know, 
we talked about you hired people with a lot of experience um, from you know places where you know that yeah. um, they've gotten some good coffee uh, experience under their belt. So um, what were your activities in getting your team ready and um, the media out to make this a, a really good like opening? Um, I think we sort of decided that we would try to do like a really quiet opening and we didn't intentionally do a lot of um, media stuff right when we opened in terms of like Instagram or anything like that. Um, but I think about after a, a, after about a week or so, um, once we kind of like opened the doors without telling anybody um, and people started coming in, I think that started to generate a little bit of buzz for us so that we were then sort of more organically able to kind of use for a more official like okay we're opening our doors we've been open um come check us out and right right before we opened um or like right around the time we were trying to open i don't know if we talked about this i think this happened almost right before we opened is somebody that we had hired had a loss in their family um and wasn't able to follow through on their like promise or whatever to come work for us. So we only had two people who were able to work for us for the first, I think almost two weeks. Oh wow. So for the first week we weren't even, we weren't even open for like the full hours the first week because we just didn't have enough people. And I was physically like unable, like just too tired. <laughs> to <laughs> right. Be here from seven seven to nine i have a little more gas in my tank now like if we needed to do something crazy like okay but at that point my tank was so empty so we had a really kind of soft first week if you will um and uh but yeah that pretty quickly turned into some local press for us um and that was helpful but we didn't have a big plan planning party or anything like that sure so sort of like in if I if I remember our last conversation correctly, it was very much like, oh, we don't have a lot of plans. We're just going to mm -hmm. kind of do our thing. <laughs> and that's very much kind of how it's gone. Okay, great. So the opening, uh, the soft opening is truly a soft opening. You just open the doors and a trickle. Yeah. It was just a trickle of people. Was it a, a lot of people, more than you were expecting? I didn't really know what to expect. It was definitely a trickle. I think the second, third, fourth, fifth day and that first weekend, we actually had some busier moments. Like I'm pretty sure like the busiest hour we had was maybe that first weekend for a couple of weeks. Um, right around then, like a lot of coffee people came through and like those first couple of weeks, especially that first week, like anybody with like a, uh, like a foodie or a coffee type Instagram handle, like they wanted to be the first people here to check it out. So we had a lot of that. Nice. A lot of influencers coming through your doors. Seem seemingly, yeah. <laughs> people want to use the space to take pictures and, and they want to have, yeah, be I don't know. It's interesting how they're they have the desire to be the first people there or, or beat people there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um when you started serving people and putting all of your uh designs and ideas into practice for people, what kind of revelations did you have um before the grand opening before the ribbon cutting and and all of that that what kind of things did you observe where you're like well geez that needs to change or uh, this needs to be added or that needs to go away what kind of things did you see needed adjustment well f physically like this space needed a lot of adjustments in terms of like we needed more light in some places we needed less light in other places and we opened the coffee shop in a very raw state. So I think over the period of the last couple of months, like we've been adding little details here um, uh, and details there to kind of like flesh out the space, help it feel like less empty, less sparse. In terms of our service concept and like the style, like we had talked about last time, we had this like desire to serve people in a bar in a bar service style. Um, I've been pleasantly surprised since day one that the that works really quite easily. Um, we haven't had, I, maybe like one or two people have sort of been confused by what it is we're trying to do. But for the most part, it's been very, very easy for us to accommodate people within the service style that we're hoping to accommodate them in. And um, I do think I was a little surprised by, like it does work really well, but it takes like an almost, an almost constant like, 
high level of attention to detail and like hyper focus on people. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like if the if the baristas don't basically spend every second of their time like looking at people's faces, which is what we're trying to coach them to do, is like when you're doing dishes, when you're making drinks, when you're I don't know what looking at Spotify, like you're also just like looking at every single person's face in the coffee shop, because that's the fastest and easiest way to tell like what's going on, what people need, are they happy, are they not happy? Um, so uh, I think we are sort of prepared for the level of like the presence that you have to muster and like the focus on, on service. But um, the actually living with it has been a little, maybe a little bit more challenging than I thought it was going to be. But that's partly because I think we had hoped to like maybe staff up a little bit more. Sure. You I had, had hoped two people. to run the coffee shop. Yeah. And the reality is that like the business is up and down a lot. We, I didn't anticipate like the hour over hour and the day over day inconsistency of opening a new business in a part of downtown Milwaukee that like isn't full of businesses again yet. So for that reason, we've had to staff with basically one person in the morning and one person in the evening, Monday through Friday. So that makes it especially challenging because like when you get those moments where like everybody comes in and they're all sitting, which is like what we're hoping for. Like, oh, everybody came in. They sat at the bar. They sat at a table. It's like you have to be a 10 armed barista just like wow. <laughs> doing everything, doing everything and like being right there for the person when they're ready for their check. You know how people are. It's like, I'm ready for my check. I'm ready to go. And it's like, um, that is a moment that you would really love to be as seamless as possible. Right. Right. So you're talking about the necessity of how much attention you need to show the guest under the model that you've determined is, is what you want to be known for. And I'm so glad to hear that it's yeah. successful. Um, it, I guess my question is, as you talk about the, the nuances of that particular service style, um, was it just that you observed that you were like falling into the traditional barista mindset behind the bar, uh, while trying to do the other, uh, style that like, what was, what was the sign that, oh, we need more attention on the guest and we was it that you were missing some cues and you needed to kind of re-up your energy and focus? I do think it's easy to get stuck into a place where you're just like you, especially as a barista, like you have this mindset like where it's like you're in position and you're making a line of drinks or something like that. Like you have this whole order of operations that you're doing and that order of operations is to like make drinks, make food, serve people. That's it. And so it is pretty easy to get like, into that zone um so to speak but um yeah I, I don't know that anything particularly happened where i had to like say to the team like hey everybody pay more attention to people right but like what happens to everybody which is sort of uncomfortable is if you're not paying attention to people and you're just working with your head down slamming out slamming out the couple of drinks or the avocado toast or whatever that's when people get up and they come over to the bar and they kind of look at you with that like <laughs> they're not upset, but they're just kind of like, they're just like the look in their face tells you like, I really hope you would come over to me with a check and like finish this out as easily as we started it. <laughs> um, oh, I can picture so many faces right now <laughs> with that look. That's perfect. Yeah, abso absolutely. Absolutely. It's like, they're just, I, maybe they're like a little crestfallen because I think like when things are going really well for us, a lot of people, I think they are sort of like, like, wow, this is kind of awesome like uh, i'm getting all this attention i'm getting like this really seamless guest experience um and then all of a sudden like we disappear and that's when i think it gets a little bit weird you never know like I, I think because of like the bar style thing like it is a sort of a normal thing when you're at a bar like the bartender does get busy they aren't able to whatever so it all depends on the person like there are plenty of people that like they don't care you know what i mean it's fine mm. um but yeah, that, I think that was really what it was that sort of like can, it continues to ha have me encourage the baristas to like look look at the faces. Yeah, that's great. I mean, we could all use that as a focus, even if our bar service is the traditional pay first, cue, pick up your drink. People always mm -hmm. come to the bar with questions and you've got a lot of uh, opportunity to go above and beyond, um, even if that's not your model. But 
Yeah, having one person on shift too, that's got to be pretty stressful for the people occupying those shifts, um, especially maybe <laughs> for the people that aren't you, since, you know, they're right. staff, they don't own it. Um, as a career barista, you know, that's something that you are very familiar with, you know, in a, in a situation where you can't really staff up more because, you know, there's not enough money coming in to do that. Um, mm -hmm. But so how do you, um, how are they handling that? And uh, is it shorter shifts or what kind of things are you thinking about as you see this happening as an owner where you're, you're observing them being a little bit more stressed maybe than you would like them to be? Describe to us kind of your thought process and maybe some plans to help alleviate that in the, in the future. Well, like one thing that I just like trying to do is just be here myself if I'm not scheduled to work during those times where I know it's going to be a little bit busier so that there are two people here that are able to sort of like manage things. Um, Cause a lot of times, like even if a person just jumps on shift here for like 15 minutes, just to like do those things, like start tickets, close tickets, take payment, or just like even not even just like running stuff from the espresso machine over to the tables, like that will go a, a long way towards accomplishing what we want and then uh, yeah sort of conversely one of the things that i've been it, interestingly maybe like one of the things that i've been encouraging people to do and i guess it all depends on people's personality like we have some people where like what i've been encouraging them to do is like actually to approach their customer service interactions with less like um frenetic excitement and just like the type of person who's going to like sit down in your booth with you and take your order and just like can just interact with people with this like calm professionalism and be speedy. <laughs> right. And um, so I think that that can be really helpful. Like you cannot kill every person with kindness. Like there's so much space to start talking to people and get caught in a conversation and there's a lot of immediate gratification that comes with that. Like, man, this person, this table, this group of people is like vibing on us so hard right now. Like I can't not just like get stuck in this conversation. Um, but we have a tendency, I think sometimes to do that almost too much. So I think if we focus on doing the job, doing the job, doing the job with the like I say, this calm professionalism that goes a long way towards like getting things done. Um, so, um, yeah, what other things have we done to help them kind of manage that, like, one person at a time thing? I think I think people's experience has been helpful. Like, they've worked in busy coffee shops, and I think you get to this kind of point where you're, it's like, you know, if you were at any normal coffee shop, like, things don't come out immediately anyways. So we, you also have to be aware of the fact that, like, People understand that you're busy. People understand that things take a minute and don't freak out. Um, like it will be okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, especially and like, I think one thing that's been working really well for us is like, because we're pushing that payment off to the end, we're not taking payment right away for anybody that's going to stay. We are able to manage some rushes a little bit more easily. Um, so, but I think there isn't been a ton that we've had had to do for people. Um, like, re realistically, the amount of times where it's been, like, so busy um, here when there's only one person, they probably only last for, like, an hour, maybe an hour and a half anyways. So it's never been the case where it's, like, a whole shift that somebody's just, like, caught off guard. Right. Well, great. Yeah, I really appreciate that approach of calm professionalism. It's so, um, it is the case that people want to just go above and beyond and maybe to the detriment of their own energy. Like you're going to burn out. You keep going that rate. You're not going to last the whole shift being that energetic, you know? Um, it, so it seems yeah. like also some self-preservation, but also guaranteeing there's something of yourself <laughs> left over for the people who are coming into the bar at the end of your shift. So you just like hate the yeah, world absolutely. <laughs> at the end of your shift. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. And yeah, you know, like in a different job, like maybe at the end of your shift, it gets okay because you're just kind of like on the espresso machine and like, I'm just going to pound drinks out and just like stay positive for the last 45 minutes. But like that here, like you can't do that because like you're slamming out drinks and then somebody comes up to you and they're like, oh, hey, can I get a cream for my coffee? And it's like, yeah, of course, totally. Absolutely. You know, you can't. Those are moments where like I think it's the desire to just kind of like deadpan somebody and be like, yeah, is very oh. real, mm. especially especially like depending on how you're ha the kind of day you're having and your own emotional state. Um, I have had the Saturday morning shifts and probably an hour. They're about an hour, maybe an hour and a half shorter than the regular shifts are. Um, that's a particularly taxing one to work on because like eh, I, the service model is really easy to accommodate when it's slow, when it's steady. But when like we have three people on and we're getting really busy, like those have been big lear learning experiences for us. Like how do we like manage all these different things um, when we're not just having people queue up in a line? Um, mm -hmm. So I, the, because they're so just like intense learning experiences and you're busy, I think sometimes the Saturday morning shifts can feel like, whoa, when you're done, it feels like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Great way to describe it. I'm curious about your energy as the owner and the time uh, you have to manage throughout the week to not only curate the experience of the guest and the shop and the employees, et cetera, but also do the back end administrative things. What have you yeah. found uh, has been helpful as you've developed, you've had to have been developing some kind of a, a rhythm or a uh, somewhat of a norm over these past three months. How has that shaken out for you? Sure. Yeah. I think that like this, hierarchy of needs maybe kind of thing is a little bit of maybe what I hear you talking about. We think that about that a lot around here. Just like if we're not taking care of ourselves, we're not able to take care of each other, we're not able to take care of anybody coming into Canary. So my own health, my own mental health has definitely been something that became a priority probably a couple of weeks after we opened that reached this like crisis point where it was like um, I can't be everything to everybody and like burn the candle at both ends all the time. Um, so I've been focusing a lot on like spending a little bit of time, maybe 10 minutes every day or maybe more if I can, just like doing nothing. Um, <laughs> self care yeah. in the parlance of our times, right? And, um, I think that's been immensely helpful. Um, just giving myself space to like process through like what's been going on um, and just to like experience things too. I think the, the perfectionist side of myself and the desire to have like what we do be like impeccable all the time and, and the inevitability that we have that like um, was something that caused me a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress. And so like trying to like let go of that and then at the same time, just like focus on the things that we can control and the things that we have to do. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I'm a person who does like to do lists, but I, I'm a person who likes to then like look at my to do list and then like visualize myself or almost think about like my day. Like, OK, so I'll take a shower and then I'm going to do this then I'm going to do that then I'll do this and then I'll go to the community and then I'll work till night. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, finding the routine, I think is something that has only come to me in the last couple of weeks, even like, Oh, okay. And on Tuesdays, we kind of do that. And you know, so it's taken a while. So your uh, rhythm kind of, unfolds before you in the last couple of weeks, which is great. Um, you're going to be uh, having to take care of a lot of the administrative stuff. Are there particular days that you just handle that where you just batch it? Like on a particular day, I'm going to do the schedule and payroll and ordering and inventory and all that other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Usually what I do when I do payroll every other Friday, um, 
which is a lot easier to do than I thought it was going to be, <laughs> thankfully. Um, I'll usually do the schedule for the next two or three weeks at that at that moment, and they say for I check a lot of stuff off the list. Like I'll I'll you know I have to go pick stuff up usually for the weekend, like avocados or whatever. Um, so yeah, I try to do a lot of stuff, and then Mondays I do a lot of administrative stuff too. But I try to keep the middle of the week more focused on just like trying to be around the cafe. Um, and yeah, I've had to be scheduled a little bit more recently and looks like I will be scheduling myself more in the next month here. Um, so yeah, it looks like my routine is about to get disrupted. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at how you've been able to, um, fill in a lot of shifts and be responsive but at the same time, it's taking you away from maybe some other stuff that needs to get done. What do you want to accomplish like in a year from now that will help you have a little bit more of a healthy balance of being in the business and being able to work on the business and as a, as a barista, but also as a, as a boss, as a owner? Oh, there are so many things that I'd love to like get better at. Um, so yeah, I think over the next 12 months, like, um, I'm hopefully focused on getting more comfortable, just like doing stuff in the back end of the business, like understanding all our profit and loss sheets, how we control costs and some of that stuff, which is like really big picture stuff, but it's important stuff. And, um, it's been challenging to find time to like figure a lot of that stuff out in this startup phase here. Um, so honestly, like, I think my goal is, to like continue to focus on like doing what we're doing um like being here being ourselves seeing smiling faces in the seats i i feel like we're on a good course right now and if we continue to like um focus on those things um that we can just grow the business R really like the thing that's been causing me the most stress and what i'm looking and hope most hopeful for for the next year is to like just to make it through this winter time and then like grow the business through the spring and summer. <laughs> mm, right. Um, so that we're no longer at a place where it's like, I mean, it's like every week or, and, and this is part of like learning how to separate my own emotional state from like the state of business of the coffee shop is a continual exercise for me. And like that probably says a lot about who I am as a person too, but there it is. <laughs> um, like, but uh, at the very, uh, because like, because the risk is so real and we're so new and it's so hot and cold, like it, it can be hard. Um, so I'd love to get to a place where we're like doing any sort of like consistent consistency in business and like seeing some consistent growth. I think that would allow, it would, I think I would allow myself more peace of mind and ability to focus on some big picture stuff um, were that to happen. Yeah, you know, you have a unique position if your coffee shop being in a place that's developing so often. And I don't need to tell right. you, but, you know, for those listening, it seems, um, you know, that it might be uh, hopeless. But so many blocks and so many neighborhoods are uh, built up around a place like Canary. And you become sort of the foundational business for a lot of growth and yeah, definitely would encourage you with yeah. that. It's just like, man, in the thick of it, it's like up and down. But in the long run, after the first year, it seems like a lot of these uh, new businesses, especially in the developing neighborhoods, um, are are going to find their rhythm and establish a, a very special bond with the people that are there. So I'm looking forward to seeing that uh, happen. And um, I, I wonder what your... Uh, most surprising i would say maybe put it a different way um what's been the most pleasantly surprising thing in the midst of the stress and having to let go of some of the perfectionism things you know in the space and schedule etc uh what has been the biggest um boost for you uh as these past three months have gone by just just being here um especially when there's people here and there's people here that are happy, like makes me feel really, really good. Um, it's been 
very sort of validating to have i think our service concepts like work with people like people will people will tell us like oh this was so different th from another coffee shop but like i loved how you just whatever it was they did um so like th those things make me feel really good like okay i'm not crazy like this is something that <laughs> can work and, and makes you feel good it does that like i think i'm a little bit over that now but there's other things that we do that like almost send like a shiver of happiness up my spine one of them is when people ask to see the coffee menu so when we when we show people like the the menu comes on cardstock on a textured paper so like we present people with this eight coffee menu and people will say like oh i like such and such and do you have do you have nutty coffees that are this and the other i don't like acidity like oh totally like you're gonna love the el porvenir from madcap because it's classic it's whatever so when people, you know, that's a really, really fun moment to me, too. Um, or So I think the coffee geek part of me loves all that stuff, just like the, the menu and like when people order flights. Um, so th those are moments I think like, uh, um, yeah, I don't love paying taxes or like, you know, deciding whether or not we can afford to spend money this week or do we have to wait to spend money next week. Um, but the moments where I do just get to be here and make coffee, especially because I think when you start to open the business, like you really quickly see the writing on the wall. Like if this goes quickly for myself, like my days actually of being able to do this thing, which I started to do this thing because ostensibly I love making coffee. They start to look numbered pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, wow, this actually does what I just told you that I hope that it does the reality for me is that like I might not actually be able to make the coffee for people five or six days a week that much longer. Wow. Boy, that's a, that's an interesting tension, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, it really is. <laughs> it really is. You know, that's kind of heartbreaking to think about. I guess it is. But then I think on another level, like it, the other thing is like, if it does go well, like we would probably do a second one, which means that I would be right back in it. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you reserve one shift for yourself, like a week or something like totally. Well, and right now, at least when I'm on bar, it's like, it's the case where like, you're usually happy that I'm here. It's not the case where like, oh, Colin's here. Like he's just going to mess things up and like, whatever, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, um, that's I do. I do have a tendency, I think, to, to come in and like start doing things, whatever. And then the barista is like, well, one of the things that I do that I know irritates them is like I have a tendency to take a lot of orders from people and make a lot of orders from people. But I forget to open or start tickets for people. So then people will come up to like close the tab or whatever. And then it's like, what do they get? Like, I don't know, because I have a terrible short term memory also. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so I won't I won't. I won't say that I never come up the works, but for the most part, like when I'm here, it's usually a boon. Mm, good, good. Yeah. And then an exercise in like trusting the delegated, you know, that you've delegated well and that, you know, they, they're they supposed yeah. to be specialists in focusing on this thing. And you've got so many other things to focus on, too. So give grace to yourself yeah. for getting yeah. you know, tabs and things like that. My last question to you is from your experience what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's in the midst of planning their shop and was you, um, in our last conversation, um, from your experience, what, what's the best advice that you could give them that would help them both be healthy in the process and, um, sort of, uh, you know, focus on the right things going forward. I guess I would say, that I think it's really important to stay true to yourself and true to the vision that you have. Um, I think it's been the case here and in other places that I've worked and observed that like people who have a really clear vision for who they are, who they want to be, for what the guest experience can look like, that goes a long way. Like if you don't know what you want to do, things will feel really confused. Um, and I think I would you know focusing on like things just like those basics of like taking care of yourself getting enough sleep like are really 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 important like this the stress of owning a business never ever ever goes away it's like just never ending and like the stakes are high and it's like you have to get used to the fact that it's just gonna always be like that and like find ways to relax regardless um and then 
I would encourage everybody to get as much funding as humanly possible. <laughs> nice. Um, I think we, I honestly, like, as strange as that might sound to say, and just, like, I don't know. It just, like, I think so much of this rest for us it, it was just, like, we were, like, we didn't have a dime to spare. And in point of fact, like, we, I think we came up a little bit short on our final contracting bill. So, and like, in spite of every single effort that I was making to try to understand, like, how much we were spending versus how much we had left, which I admittedly, I, because I don't think I was doing a very good job of taking care of myself, like, I had so much anxiety surrounding the finances of the business, especially at the end of August. Like, I think we overspent in areas. Um, so, that being said, like, I think I would just encourage everybody to, like, and this is something that everybody told me to, but it's, <laughs> I just like definitely true is like try to have extra funding if you can to just like get get yourself open so that like when you realize that you don't have what you need like you can get it and yeah and this I is don't know funding that. that you wouldn't touch because I can imagine like you don't have a dime to spare you get extra funding and then it just disappears into something so you would like set that aside and yeah the, like the what if category I would set that aside in a what if category, especially with maybe the intention that you focus on spending some of that money. Maybe, maybe it's enough for like two or three months of like having one, like a half person on payroll for a day or something like that. Mm. Um, because I, I think that, yeah, one of the things that is going to be hard for us to grow the coffee shop is like, to have and i think this is probably true for a lot of coffee shops is like you want to have the bandwidth to be busy um so that people feel like they can have an easy and sort of like expedient experience when they come back um but in our case we're so hyper focused on like the service side so like so i if i were to tell myself like yeah have that extra money so that we can continue to like really focus on like um having the amount of staff that we need um so yeah, that mm -hmm. we don't necessarily get into the circumstance that we're like that we're in now, where it's like now I have to work five shifts a week, um, and do everything else um, because like we had a really slow November, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Which is one of those things. I I think it sounds to me like basically most of the coffee shops that I talked to around the entire Midwest, like November was crap for the, all of them. That they got really cold really fast. Even the Midwesterners weren't ready for it. Sure. And like, I think our sales dropped off like 15% in November over October. And I was think I was counting on like maybe the opposite <laughs> because usually like a holiday time is a really good time for coffee. Oh, for sure. I've been hearing similar things. So it's not, it's, yeah, it's uh, not personal. So, it's <laughs> like everyone's going no, through it. No, no. Well, it's not, it's, it's not personal. And I think like, like I was just saying a second ago, like I have like, and I would imagine that a lot of business owners have that, especially when it's been like a mission vision that's been close to your heart. It's like, it's like there are moments where like, I'm not telling myself this, but I can like hear my subconscious mind telling myself like, it's like, no, nobody likes what you're doing at Canary. Like, oh, if you just made it like everything else, like maybe more people would be coming here, you know? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> Yeah. Finding that space not to take it personally and to internalize what's going on at the coffee shop is something that um, takes practice. Man, those are all very, very uh, powerful and wise things. I think um, everyone would do well to, to live by for sure. And your lived experience in this is, is a powerful testimony to that. So where can we find more information about Canary and visit you in the uh, times that we're in Milwaukee? Well, we're on Instagram at Canary Coffee Bar. Um, that's probably the best place to follow along with what we're doing. Some weeks we do better at social media than others. Um, I think uh, we can talk more about that some other time. <laughs> and we're on Third Street in Milwaukee. So if you're in Milwaukee, you go to Third Street in Wisconsin, and you can't miss our coffee shop. It says Canary Coffee in big gold letters way up in the window. Um, we're across the street from this giant blue building. Um, so you can't miss us when you're in downtown Milwaukee. There's not a whole bunch around us that's open right now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, but yeah, that's the, the those are the best places to find us.
Um, so yeah, if you're in Milwaukee, come visit us. Um, come visit us for sure. The menu's always changing, and I think that's one of the things that's exciting about being here is like you never know what we're going to have uh, on our offering sheet. Yeah, such a unique concept. Beautiful space, awesome coffee, and uh, definitely awesome people. So definitely make it out to Canary. Uh, thank you so much, Colin, for uh, taking time to talk to us again. It's been really awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. Well, I want to say thank you so much to Colin for taking a lot of time to talk with us in the midst of you know building out and opening Canary Coffee Bar uh, to give us an inside look of what it's like to open a coffee bar and his experiences and the vulnerability that he displayed in you know sharing about the the emotional ups and downs the business hurdles and what it really strikes me about Colin's story here at Canary Coffee Bar is something that's similar for a lot of people who are on Founder Friday and that is the fact that you're going to be forced to decide on what your non-negotiables are because a lot of other things around you are negotiable um, maybe there's some interior stuff that didn't get finished that you really were hung up on that you wanted to get finished. Um, maybe the menu board doesn't look exactly like you want it to, but the core of your business is maybe not those things. It's like for Colin, it's the service component. It's making sure that that works well and that people are taken care of. And as that succeeds, then you can build bandwidth from there to start solving a little more of these minor things that are previously during the planning stages maybe not so minor maybe they were things that were really sweat over but in the operation of the coffee bar you realize maybe they weren't worth the kind of stress that i i put on those and so i hope that this episode was uh, helpful for your journey in uh, coffee bar ownership and operation canary coffee bar is such a beautiful space and colin is a consummate professional um, and people are really enjoying their work there at Canary. So if you're in Milwaukee, then please do stop by Canary Coffee Bar. And if you're not in Milwaukee, then uh, go to Milwaukee and go to Canary Coffee Bar. So one of the best ways to contact them uh, is going to be the Instagram account. That's just Canary Coffee Bar on Instagram. If you want a website, the canarycoffeebar.com website is great. You can contact them through that as well. So thanks again, Colin, for joining us on the show. If you want the transcript from this episode, you can go to keystotheshop.com and on the contact page, just fill in your information and you'll be signed up to be on the email list. You'll receive the transcript and other resources in your inbox. It's as easy as that. We just send the transcript, sometimes some bonus audio from the episodes um, and extra resources for you. That's over at keystotheshop.com. Now, if you want to contact me, you can do so by emailing chris at keystotheshop.com. And uh, I would love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, feedback, things like that. If you uh, are interested in working with Keys to the Shop Consulting also uh, to help you and your business's operations, um, that is the email address to use, chris at keystotheshop.com. It would be so great to hear from you. And so that is the end of our episode. Thank you so much for joining me on this last Founder Friday of 2019. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.